That's only six months. Yes, that's uh, what I'm wondering. I, I think it's to, for, for the for the 12 months, for the 12 prospective months. So, so clarification that it's not the fiscal year, but for, for the, the next right. for a twelve month period over twelve month Correct. period. Twelve. So you have a you wanted to change your motion. Uh, your motion was um, made and seconded by Ms. Moriarty. Ms. Moriarty, do you agree with that amendment? That's acceptable. Okay, uh, Mr. Deuce. Uh, uh, clarification: Is this one contract for five projects, or will we? Break this down to five separate contracts per, you know, one per project. The way I'll structure it, uh, for example, the external auditors have a five-year contract, but it's a two-year contract with three option years. So again, this is a, a, a test test period. So I'll structure the contract to be five, one-year contract with four option years, or two option years. And we could, we no, could always... My question is, uh, we haven't worked with this firm before to do this internal audit supplement. Uh, we have potentially five projects we might address this coming calendar year. Uh, would it not make sense to try to, to bifurcate or split these into separate contracts and see how it works? Uh, uh, and see if we're satisfied with their efforts? Uh, or or it's, I'm, I'm very unclear. For example, they could spend... You know, maybe 90000 on this one project, and it doesn't leave us enough to do, complete the other four projects. If I could maybe I agree with what Andy is saying, maybe the way to phrase it would be that we could, that we could, uh, we could, we could terminate, either party can terminate the, the contract at will. Okay. Is that, would that suit you? In other words, you, you do the 100000 like Pete said, but if either party, they can or we can terminate the contract, that will, which would help us if we find the permanent auditor that we're looking for. So, you know, but I don't know about five-year contracts and so on. I mean, I, I, they, the intent is to go nowhere near five years here. I mean, we're hoping to find, right? Okay. First of all, all contracts that are multi-year, they have to, the purchasing department has a flag on every single one of them, and they call us and they ask us if they want to renew for each year. It is subject to funding. Right. So it's, it's not a real five-year contract. It's, it's going to be in pieces. So the first piece, uh, it could be, you could put in the uh, up to $100,000 and uh, to the point that it, one can cost 90000 which I hope it wouldn't, but uh, it, it could be terminated at any point. By either part, they can terminate or we can terminate, Correct. hopefully. Yes. Does that work for you? I think so. Ms. Hess. That's a good idea. Yeah, I, I don't think it would be a good idea to have an individual contract for each audit because you don't get the benefit of them maybe potentially doing it concurrently or synergies, et cetera. But I think as long as the language in the contract is up to 100000 to cover five audits, and that would be the intent, they should have to, as part of that, then deliver um, basically the five audits within that contract price. So this way, if one is 10 and one is 30, that would be delivered. If, if I may, how about, how about I start the contract with the loom and I send it to the audit committee and get the approval uh, as far as sufficiency as everybody's happy. Sounds like contract. a great idea, Mr. Monarski. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, Ms. Hess. Yeah, and uh, the only other thing I wanted to just add when uh, Mr. Weisbrod went through sort of some of the priority areas, um, I just wanted to say, you know, we, we discussed it at the audit committee, but we also did it in conjunction with uh, Peter Minarski, you know, the comptroller, and it was also based on sort of your insight and your recommendation. So I just didn't want it to be a one-sided, just an audit committee, but it was a collaborative discussion Correct, yeah. that also included finance. I think that's important to know. You know, we did, you know, look to some of your um, your thoughts and, and, and some of your recommendations on how to approach it. So I just think that's important. For that's the right. That's absolutely right. Further, further discussion? Okay. We have a motion by um, Mr. Weisbrot, seconded by Ms. Moriarty, to authorize the controller to enter into discussions and a contract with an outside entity to perform five audits uh, in an amount of up to $100,000. All in favor, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That item has, that new item to the agenda has carried. Um, and uh, thank you to the audit committee for addressing this so quickly and Mr. Minarski for taking this on as well. Uh, uh, Mr. Weisbrod, was there anything else from the audit committee you wanted to report on? I think that should be enough for now. Okay. 
Okay. We also have a report from our Policy and Procedures Committee, Mr. Raymer and Mr. Mason. So it's not common that a committee reports on something in which there was a motion made but no second. Uh, uh, so, uh, and that's in, in fact the case here. Um, uh, I had distributed to the full membership of the BET uh, four proposed amendments to the Policy and Procedures Manual. Uh, each of them were uh, to add an element of germaneness. Uh, uh, it related to three different subject matters. Uh, one was uh, the occasion of calling a special meeting. Uh, two of them related to um, adding uh, four members of the BET adding an item to an agenda on 10 business days notice. And one of them related to adding an item uh, to the agenda of a committee of the BET at the request of half the <coughs> members. Um, I, I made that motion. It was an item uh, that, that, as I say, was distributed to each of the members. Uh, it did not receive a second, so it's not moving forward at this meeting. Uh, I'll raise the matters again in January or whenever it is that we're addressing the um, uh, policy and procedures component uh, of our handbook uh, for a more fulsome discussion by the membership at that time. And uh, I don't know if Mr. Mason wants to add something to that report. Mr. Mason. Um, thank you, Mr. Rimmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, that, that the, there's just one clarification, one comment. It's really one amendment, but it happens to apply in four spots. So it's, it's really just one idea. It just happens to apply. And I, I would say that we had, this, we had two meetings on this, actually. We had an, a meeting, I can't remember when. And, and no, it was, it was later than that. I think it was in the October time frame. And at that time, we had a discussion, and there was a very good dialogue about the, what the motion was trying to do. And it, it, it sort of takes away from the intent of the, the four members being able to add something to the agenda. So we decided at that time to postpone until our November meeting, and we, we really hadn't cured the issue. The issue was, in simplest forms, if four members want to add something to our agenda, there was a the the modification would would give the chair the discretion to decide if they were germane and then put it on the agenda or not well that sort of goes against the idea of the four people putting the idea, item on the agenda the word germane in the language the board of selectmen have some of that language we don't have that i don't know the history behind their language so it and, and, I, and I don't want to speak for Mr. Raymer, but it, it created another problem which we weren't intending on creating, so it, it, it has to be looked at. And being that we're at the end of the term, I think it, it wasn't, it, we weren't going to solve this, and so we just, it ended up this way. But thank you. Okay. So that brings us to the BET liaison reports, and uh, we have, at least on the agenda, identified three liaisons for reports, starting with uh, the liaison to Parks and Recreation, Ms. Fesliotis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there are, uh, for Parks and Rec, one, two, three, four, uh, four areas that have been uh, worked on this past year. The Eastern Greenwich Civic Center, progress continues with the following accomplishments. Contract number 6864 between the town and TSKP Studio of Hartford, Connecticut was issued on November 12th, 2019 for the replacement of Eastern Greenwich Civic Center. Um, the committee had met and awarded the contract to TSKP Studio. Uh, capital funds have been provided in fiscal 20 to begin the 30% design and site plan. So that's going to be uh, going forward. Uh, with Dorothy Hamill, the evaluation study of the existing ice skating rink facility has been completed by KG&D and has been posted on the Town of Greenwich website under PNR News. Uh, the committee continues to be engaged in a review of the study and to evaluate and reach decisions. Capital funds in the amount of 250000 have been included in DPW's fiscal year 20 budget for architect selection and design. The Parks and Rec Foundation, which as you know is a private nonprofit organization to support and enhance our town's heritage of parks and open spaces, um, are currently working with the Friends of Binney Park to raise funds to complete the park restoration. And the foundation has also worked with the town to underwrite the 4th of July fireworks. 
um, the field study um, that the Board of Ed basically is leading. After completing two rounds of ranking vendor applicants, the committee uh, that has is comprised of both town and BOE members have selected Weston and Sampson as the vendor of choice. Um, apparently initial exceptions regarding insurance have been resolved and the contract is currently in the hands of the town's law department. Um, the next steps after the contract is resolved is a kickoff meeting with Weston and Sampson to discuss the project details and timeline. Thank you, Ms. Vasliotis. Okay, seeing no questions. The next is a report from the education liaisons. Uh, yes, the, um, an update on the Board of Ed capital processes project was provided to the Board of Ed at its November 7th meeting. The project is continuing and staff is committed to providing the tools needed for its staff to control uh, capital spending and make its uh, capital budget uh, forecasts. The focus still is on finalizing procedures and then applying those in a test case uh, to some fiscal 21 capital projects. The developments on other recommendations, included in the report, have been a little delayed as the focus was on establishing the procedures and they do have a change in personnel. Uh, one of the next steps that they do want to focus on probably sometime next year is looking at software enhancements to better support the new system. Uh, and clearly we have an interest in, in understanding what their direction is on that. Uh, the other items on the Board of Ed agenda, just uh, so this board is aware that the, the board, their board is expecting to discuss and possibly vote on a proposal for a, moving forward with uh, addressing the facility issues at Cardinal Stadium at its November 21st meeting on Thursday night. And then also at that November 7th meeting, the superintendent had presents, presented her recommend, recommendations for the fiscal 21 budget. That budget is now in the hands of the board and they have meetings established for December 5th and a vote on December 17th on their recommended budget. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hess, anything to add? Okay, and the last report is from the IT liaisons. Mr. Chair, Ms. Hess. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the controller's report under risk management, we think, uh, does an excellent job of encapsulating um, the advances and where we are. Um, we have, just as of last week, received the final uh, departmental report from Cyber Defenses on their assessment. Uh, we have been monitoring those reports as they have been coming in. Um, and since we have everything in now, we're going to be meeting. Our first meeting actually is tomorrow at 11 o'clock to look at those reports to begin to uh, come up with uh, cost estimates. Uh, we will have those cost estimates uh, certainly in time for the budget discussions for fiscal 2021 uh, and also part of those uh, or as part of the cost estimates we'll also have um, some organ organizational recommendations for management of IT security going, uh, going forward. Thank you, Ms. Hess, anything to add? No, all right, thank you, Mr. Turner. Um, which brings us to the special project teams. I note that I did not ask for a report from the Nathaniel Witherell Strategic Planning Committee and that's not because they're not working uh, diligently. They are, they have just a couple of meetings scheduled before the December meeting and I would expect that that will be on the agenda for December. So I wanna thank all of the members of the Nathaniel Witherell Strategic Planning Committee for their hard work. Um, Mr. Raymer, Mr. Mason, I wasn't sure whether you wanted to talk at all about labor contracts or, or not. I have nothing new to add. There's, uh, there's an interesting legislative act where the Board of Ed has the authority to enter into agreements with one of the bargaining units, LIUNA. If I'm misspoken, I'm, I'm, I apologize. It, it, it's, it's a sort of an open area in the, the way the Connecticut General Statute's written on this. Um, in this particular contract, as you know, in the education contracts, uh, the BET, we, Ms. Oberlander, you and I are obviously the ones that have served on all of those negotiating teams. Uh, we weren't involved in this one. So I think, I think there's a conversation going on between the Labor Contracts Committee right now and the Board of Education team that did the contract. So I have nothing to add more to it. I think, I think our goal should always be 
consistency in our negotiations and similar goals and, and knowing the impacts to the budget and when, when these decisions are made. So I, I, other than that, I don't, I have had no other communications with them on that. Okay, thank you very much. So that concludes um, the reports from our special project teams and liaisons and we'll now move to item I have it listed as item 10 on our, our agenda, old business. And uh, for that, Mr. Rimmer and I are going to switch places again. I mentioned again that the town has um, retained uh, counsel, uh, town attorney pro tem. Uh, it's Mr. Stephen Fogarty of the firm of Halloran Sage. Uh, Mr. Fogarty, I, it might be more convenient for you if you came up and joined us at what looks like council table. That'll be familiar to you as council table. We, we use a different expression here, but. Um, I wish you pass one of those along each way. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Fogarty, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was distributed by our chair um, uh, uh, at, by email uh, at 7.44 yesterday evening um, a, um, uh, a proposed uh, replacement panel uh, for the investigative committee uh, that it was uh, requested or sought or commanded uh, by the September 23rd um, uh, meeting of the BET. Uh, so at this point, uh, I would ask uh, if there's a motion to adopt uh, that committee. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, the privilege of discussion goes first uh, to the moving party. Mrs. Oberlander, do you have some comment? No. Uh, the second uh, priority then would fall to the person to the seconder, Mrs. Moriarty. No comment. Uh, is there anybody else who wishes to comment? I'll offer, uh, by the way, some guidance uh, here if I can. Um, as you'll recall from our last meeting, uh, when um, a panel is proposed like this that has four persons on it that are not members of this board, uh, at least not sitting members at this time, uh, plus two members that are sitting members, uh, any member of this board can object to any of the proposed committee members who are not sitting members. That uh, privilege to object does not apply to the two proposed members of the committee that are sitting members of this board. Uh, at the end of this process or during this process, any member can make a motion uh, to strike any one or more of the proposed non-members, non-sitting members of the BET. There will also uh, can be a motion at the end uh, to uh, sustain or not sustain the panel as it was originally proposed. With those uh, guidelines, maybe that sounded more confusing than it actually is, but is there any comment from any members of the board at this time? Mr. Mason, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm making a motion. I'm, I'm going to make a motion to amend the motion before us. Uh, the, the motion before you is the proposal of a panel. Are you proposing to amend the panel? Yes. Uh, uh, please state the amendment you're proposing. I move to amend the panel before us to remove the following individuals. William R. Finger, Bruce Angelillo, Marita Hamre, and James Lash, and replace them with the following two individuals, Karen Fasiliotis and Jeffrey Raymer. Uh, well, uh, you have the ability to uh, move to strike. Uh, and I'll respect and honor that motion. Your proposal of replacement members, I regret, is out of order. And I have to challenge the, the ruling chair. of the chair. I, I appeal the ruling of the chair. Uh, so the uh, motion before us, if you recall, was a motion for the chair to form a BET committee to investigate Connecticut State Elections Enforcement Commission, et cetera. It was a motion for the chair. 
It went on to say, the committee formed by the BET chair will meet the minority representation, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, those are the components of the motion. So the motion seeks uh, that the composition come from the chair, and the second part of the motion seeks for uh, the movement to be proposing members, and that's not the movement's uh, privilege. Uh, so I'm going to have to uh, move that uh, to uh, as being out of order. Well, uh, again, I'm appealing the motion of the chair for the following reason. This is an agenda item which is before us, and it makes it a main motion under Robert's rules. As a main motion, it may be amended by this body. The argument that there was no notice under FOIA is not relevant, as the motion was noticed on the agenda, so there was plenty of notice. Again, the chair has put a motion before us as an agenda item, and as such, it can be amended by the majority of the board body. I am therefore appealing the ruling of the chair and request that this body vote to overturn the ruling. So uh, let me, if I can, uh, partially in response to that, uh, read certain components from Robert's rules, and then I think uh, I'm going to seek um, an opinion from the town council for the position on behalf of the town as to this uh, for us to be able to proceed. So uh, let me first read, if I can, uh, from Robert's rules. It's from section 13, page 174, which says, a standing or special committee may include or even have as its chairman one or more persons who are not members of the assembly or society, but if the chair appoints the committee, the names of all such non-members being appointed must be submitted to the assembly for approval. Unless the bylaws or motion to appoint the committee specifically authorizes the presiding officer to appoint non-members, which in our case, of course, it did not. Then there's a cross-reference uh, to page 492. So reading from 492, allow me to read, like, still from Robert's Rules. The power to appoint a committee carries with it the power to appoint the chairman and to fill any vacancy that may arise in the committee. It's possible for persons who are not members of the assembly or the society to be appointed to committees, even to the position of committee chair. On the subject of uh, the ability to amend a motion, uh, it, there's a requirement, uh, as you will recur, recall, for prior notice. Let me, if I may, read from Robert's Rules. In this case, I'm reading from section 10, page 121. The term previous notice, as applied to necessary conditions for the adoption of certain motions, has a particular meaning in parliamentary law. A requirement of previous notice means that announcement of the motion will be, that the motion will be introduced, indicating its exact content as described below, must be included in the call of the meeting at which the motion will be brought up, or, as a permissible alternative, if no more than a quarterly time interval will have elapsed since the preceding motion, the announcement may be made at the preceding, uh, at the preceding meeting. In our particular case, we have in our um, uh, policy and procedures manual a provision that allows for items to be added to an agenda. It appears at page 18, and it reads as follows. Items shall be added to the meeting agenda at the request of four members of the BET, communicated to the chair at least 10 business days prior to the meeting. In this particular case, perhaps I'm mistaken, but so far as I'm aware, no request was communicated to the chair indicating the four members who are making the request, and that specifically a request is being made to add an item to the agenda on November 18th, and with reasonable detail, the uh, item that is being, uh, being added. Um, uh, you made reference to um, the, um, uh, uh, the statute. It's worth uh, taking a look at the statute, too. Uh, allow me just a second here. Section 1-225 uh, of the Connecticut General Statutes at subsection C says, the agenda of the regular meetings of every public agency shall be available to the public and shall be filed not less than 24 hours before the meetings to which they refer. One, in such agency's regular office or place of business, and two, in the office of the clerk of such subdivision for any public agency of a political subdivision of the state. 
Then a sentence later, upon the affirmative vote of two thirds of the members of a public agency present in voting, any subsequent business not included in such filed agendas may be considered and acted upon at such meetings. So what we have before us is uh, a motion in which you're seeking to uh, amend uh, the item before us is to present a panel and you're bringing a motion to change the provisions of the motion that was made and passed on the 23rd of September. And I respectfully disagree. The chair has put on the agenda a motion to approve um, What's the exact language? Excuse me. It's a vote on the appointment of committee submitted by the chair pursuant to a motion adopted on September 23rd. The motion on the floor is a main motion under Robert's rules. It's a motion that may be amended by this body. I respectfully uh, disagree with your interpretation and council's interpretation. I believe that um, we have the opportunity and the, and the right to, it's been noticed, um, even though the chair uh, did not uh, put it in the, uh, in the package uh, that was distributed, um, she did provide us with with her uh, interpretation of what she felt the committee was. Um, but it it is a main motion that may be amended by this body. Um, and again, the argument under FOIA is not relevant because the motion was noticed on the agenda by the chair and there was plenty of notice um, as far as that's concerned. So again, I'm appealing the ruling of the chair and I'm asking for the, the uh, body to vote to overturn the so, ruling. So let's be clear on our facts. The item that's on the agenda, first of all, is not what you said. It says, I'm reading now from the agenda, vote on appointment of committee members submitted by the chair pursuant to motion <laughs> adopted at September 23, 2019, BET meeting. Right, but so, if you... No, no, stay with me. Please don't interrupt. I didn't interrupt you. Uh, secondly, uh, it, it is not disputed that no request was made of the chair for this item to be placed on the agenda. Thirdly, this item does not appear on the agenda. So the issues that I think I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Fogarty to give us some assistance on are the following points. First, uh, Mr. Fogarty, we'd be grateful for your assistance. Does this item require a two-thirds vote under Section 1-225C to be entertained on the agenda? Yes. Secondly, um, uh, is the motion that you have heard from uh, Ms. Fasoliotis, is that a, um, a proper motion to amend the item which is on the agenda? No. Uh, I'd like to just add under Robert Schulz at 495 that when the members are put forth, there can be a motion to strike out, and it specifically states that any member can then move to strike out one or more names, but not to insert new ones. So I think the point is explicit in Robert's rules, and I think the point is explicit quite separately also in the Freedom of Information Act. So um, and I, again, I, I, I would I, 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 the the appeal is out of order uh, because well, no, oh, whoa, no, whoa. no, no, you can't do that. Come I mean, on. there's an you, appeal of the ruling of the chair, Mr. The Raymer. appeal of the ruling of the chair has to be voted on. Mr. Raymer, that is Excuse absolutely, me. I am intervening here. There is an appeal of the chair. Mr. Mason, I will call on you in a moment. I know you're you not, will. You're, 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 well, maybe I won't. But uh, 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 you, you don't take the control of the meeting. I'll call on you. Each then, person will speak in turn. Then I suggest you you're, get control. Well, I'm, I'm certainly trying to maintain a measure of control. Uh, uh, you, you are seeking now to do something which is in violation of the Connecticut General Statutes. And, and sir, that's your opinion. That is right. not the opinion of the person that is making the appeal. So, For the reasons that I stated, this is a main motion that is not, that is before us and it is, um, 
and you available can, for amendment. So if I can read further then from Robert's Rules. Robert's Rules, first of all, deals with the question of what when there is an attempt to exercise an authority which is not vested in you by statute, meaning that you're seeking to breach statute, and it reads as follows. Aside from rules of parliamentary, I'm sorry, I'm reading from page three, section one. Aside from rules of parliamentary procedure and the particular rules of an assembly, the actions of any deliberative body are also subject to applicable procedural rules prescribed by local, state, or national law and would be null and void if in violation of such law. So to the extent that you're hearing a ruling from Mr. Fogarty that what you're seeking to do violates the Freedom of Information Act, the action you're seeking is null and void. Uh, I, I don't Excuse me, I'm not done. Okay. I'm not done. I won't interrupt you. Don't interrupt Alrighty. me. It's your opinion. Secondly, secondly, you're seeking to create a process here. And on the question of the ability or power of a body to create process, now reading from section two, page 10. The only limitations upon the rules that such a body can adopt might arise from the rules of a parent body or from the national, state, or local law affecting the type of an organization. Then thirdly, to the extent that you're seeking to suspend the rules as laid out in the September 23rd motion and substitute something else, that now becomes a motion to suspend the rules about which Robert's Rule says at page 25, page 263, no applicable procedural rule prescribed by federal, state, or local law can be suspended unless the rule itself specifically provides for its own suspension. Uh, lastly, on the question of whether or not a later action can ratify such an illegal act, Robert's Rules at section 10, page 125 says, an assembly can ratify only such actions of its officers, committees, delegates, or subordinate bodies as would have had the right to authorize it in advance. It cannot ratify anything done in violation of procedural rules prescribed by national, state, or local law. So unfortunately, you can argue that it's your appeal, but since your appeal violates the Freedom of Information Act, those acts are a nullity and are out of order. I, I would respectfully disagree with your contention that this violates FOIA and is not, is null and void. This does not violate FOIA. This was noticed in the, min in the uh, agenda. It's a main motion, as I stated before, that is totally amendable by this body. Um, and um, I am staying with the, with the uh, appeal to the chair, and I am requesting a vote. Yeah, well, uh, it's a nullity, and I will not call a vote. Well, then, you know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Chairman, I have a privilege motion. Um, the, no, I, 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 it's not a privileged motion. I'll, if you you don't to, know the motion. How can you rule that it's not privileged? Uh, I think, Mr. Fogarty, Mr. Fogarty uh, we invite your comment. On what point? Uh, on uh, whether or not I'm obliged to bring their appeal to a vote. Bring their appeal to a vote or not. If you if it's a nullity, it's a nullity. However, that you can be challenged at a later point. But that's up to you as the chairman okay. to, to do so or to not so the do decision, so. But the, I'm, I'm not going to opine on whether you should or okay. should not bring anything okay. to a vote. I'm, uh, I, I, point of, point yeah. of information, if I may. Yeah, I'll honor a point of information. Through you two, Mr. Gentleman. Yes. Are you advising Mr. Raymer that it's his discretion to call this item for a vote or not? I'm not. I'm not opining on that one way or the other, oh, okay. as, I, as I stated. Is there any other comment on the motion that is actually before us? That's a motion on the panel. I have heard a motion from Mrs. Fasiliotis uh, to strike four names. That part of the motion I would honor. If somebody wishes to restate that motion, we could hold discussion and a vote on that motion. The portion that I can't honor is the effort by Mrs. Fasiliotis to uh, add two additional names to the panel which is not the authority of Mrs. Fasiliotis or even this body at large. Is there any further comment? I, Mr. Mason. 
You have ruled finally that you're not going to take a vote on that. That's correct. It's a nullity. Okay. I will, you, make, I will make a comment on that decision of yours. I think that's an unwise decision. I think the motion before you is a main motion. It's amendable. Certainly there's nothing new in this conversation that didn't happen a month ago. Certainly <clears throat> people doing homework on this have come to you and the point is stated. You are making a decision on a nullity and you're not calling for a vote that's a motion on before us. No, it's not before us. Uh, I, it is before us. No, it's not. It's a nullity. It's, an, it, it's a motion that seeks an act in violation of the Connecticut General Statutes. And as has been said to you in four different places in Robert's Rules, he, it's a nullity. You have been advised by that attorney over there that it could be, in your opinion and his opinion, but that would have to be decided at a later date. Okay. So I, I do not recall where you would get the authority to, to have this judge and jury atmosphere. I, I'll emphasize again, I think you're making a critical mistake that will have other ramifications for your decision on this. I, 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 I am of the belief that the motion is within order, and I believe it would be seconded, and I think you should call for the vote on this motion. The items that's before us is a vote on the appointment of the committee. Is there any further com uh, comment on that? Does anybody wish to make the first half of Mrs. Fasliotis' motion? That is a motion that is very much in order if someone wishes to make that motion. I would ask for a 10-minute recess. They don't even, they have no, do they have, whatever the town has. They have their own Wi-Fi. No, they said they didn't in no, one of the meetings. It, it uh, the it's 8 Dean, can we come back to order, please? Uh, if there's no other discussion, I'm going to call the vote on the item that's before us. Um, hold on a minute. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't know. While I do not agree with your uh, ruling, and I have never in my uh, uh, time on the RTM or on this body ever heard of a chair refusing to uh, rule on an appeal, I will amend my motion to strike William R. Finger, Bruce Angelillo, Marita Hamray, and James Lash from the committee to leave Michael Mason and Leslie Moriarty as the two members of the committee. Um, is there a second on that motion? Second. Uh, be advised that uh, when a change is made in the committee, the panel goes back to the chair. The chair can offer no change and accept that, or she can offer um, uh, replacement persons. It can be one, two, three, four, any number. She can offer an entirely new panel. But the vote that's before us right now is a motion by Mrs. Fasliotis seconded by Mr. Mason, and as a motion to strike the four non-BET sitting members, uh, James Lash, Bill Finger, uh, Bruce Angelillo, and uh, Marita Hamri. Uh, it's seconded. Is there any further discussion on that proposed amendment? If there's no discussion on that, I'm going to call uh, a vote. Uh, a yes vote is a vote in favor of striking those names, a no vote is a vote against striking those names. Uh, Mr. Dewis. Yes. Uh, Ms. Hess. Yes. Mr. Weisbrod. No. Mr. Drake. Yes. Mr. Mason. Yes. Ms. Moriarty. No. Ms. Oberlander. No. Ms. Crummick. No. Mr. Raymer votes no. Ms. Tarkington. Mr. Turner. I'm voting for the people, yes. Uh, Ms. Fasliotis. Yes. Uh, the, it passes 7-5. Uh, the uh, panel uh, is rejected. Uh, that uh, brings us, uh, is there any further uh, amendments being proposed? I guess there's none that really can be proposed. Uh, I think that concludes that matter. 
Uh, I'm going to return the chair to Ms. Oberlander for item 11 on the um, agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried to steal it, but it wouldn't. Did not leave it for you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fogarty. Okay. We are at item uh, 11, new business. We have two items of new business. The first is to review and vote on the 2020 calendar for the uh, next term of the BET. Uh, you've all received a, um, a draft of the calendar in your packets. Can I have a motion to put it on the floor? We have a motion by Mr. Raymer, seconded by Ms. Tarkington. Any discussion? What's that? Ms. Moriarty. I just want to highlight one thing. I know that we, at times, uh, amend calendars moving forward, and it's possible that in January, when new committees are formed, that the calendar gets reevaluated. But I did want to make a comment on what Mr. Geiger mentioned to me. Last year, there was, um, there was a very short period of time between when the BET voted on the budget and the documents needed to be turned around for the RTM. So the RTM has not yet identified the dates of its 2020 meetings. Um, so I just uh, identified that as a potential issue. We'll follow up with the leadership of the RTM just to look at their calendar and to determine, uh, to make sure there's no conflict with getting the budget turned around. Thank you, Ms. Moriarty. Further discussion on the 2020 calendar? Okay. All in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Um, I'm going to abstain from the vote on this calendar. Uh, the vote is 11 0 1. The uh, next item of new business, uh, as all of you know, I have submitted my resignation from the BET effective November 30th, which leaves a vacancy on the BET for the concluding month. Uh, I'd like to move to appoint Laura Erickson to fill that BET vacancy. She was duly elected and would be taking office in January. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to appoint her effective December 1st to fill the vacancy. Is there? Seconded by Mr. Raymer. Any discussion? All in favor for uh, approving the appointment of Ms. Erickson to, uh, for a term to commence December 1st. Aye. 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 Any, I guess I'm going to be sending for this one too. Any, any um, objection? And I'm going to, I'm trying to think of whether I need to abstain from that or not. No, I don't. So then I'm going to approve it too. So that my item has carried 12-0. Congratulations, Ms. Erickson, and welcome to the board. The You're stuck now. <laughs> 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 You're stuck now. <laughs> okay. Mr. Mason. We, we will have to have provisions at a meeting, or she may have to maybe stop by the town clerk's office and get sworn in. So we can't forget that and show up at our December series of meetings. I, I'm assuming that our chair is going to ask that you cover other than the full BET meeting committee assignments. No. Oh, okay. So uh, I, if I, I just I, ask no, a question. so I, I'm, I'm going to get to committee assignments. No, no, no. I'm just saying in, oh, okay, you're doing something different. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the chair's report. 
So before I get into uh, my own comments, I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that the new Lebanon school dedication has been scheduled for December 7th. I think it starts at 10 a.m. If you haven't already uh, received notice of that and if you'd like to attend, I'm sure it will be publicized. It's a Saturday morning. That Saturday, there are a lot of activities in town celebrating the holiday season as well. So. Um, I am sure we'll see many of you out and about. Um, and then uh, on my own comments. As you know, I've submitted my resignation from the BET effective November 30th, and this is my last BET meeting. It has been an honor and a privilege to serve on the BET, and I thank the voters for their support for the two years that they elected me and put their trust in me. Uh, after four years on this body, I want to particularly recognize the dedication and effort of all members, some of whom predate me in service to the town. Each of us takes our role as fiduciary of town finances very, very seriously, and we all work hard to find compromise to protect the town's interest. A model of collegiality was set by those who came before us. Mary Lee Kiernan, Nancy Weisler, Jim Lash, Larry Simon, Bill Finger, Art Norton, and John Blankley, to name a few of the highly qualified and respected community members whom I had the great opportunity to work with. I'm honored to have had the trust of each of you to lead this board for this term. And I again thank um, my colleague Michael Mason for providing guidance throughout. This BET has accomplished quite a lot. Some examples that we can all be proud of. Our two-year term saw the lo lowest average annual increase in the mill rate in many years, all the while protecting services that our town residents value and, and need. We initiated critical strategic planning on a diverse range of topics, including Nathaniel Witherall, cybersecurity defense, and field improvements. We engaged to support critical transportation services for our community's aged and disabled populations, entered into a joint review with the Board of Ed Greenwich Public Schools to address capital project management processes, and we invited RTM members into a dialogue about long-term financing. Thank you all for your hard work over these past two years and for what you will continue to do going forward. There are some challenges ahead and I know that you will work collaboratively together. A special thank you to all of the very dedicated town employees who consistently work so hard to make our jobs easier. And I need to particularly call out the finance department, so ably led by Peter Minarski, and including Roland Geiger, Natasha Yemitz, Maureen Tracy, Elaine Brown, and Kathy Sidor, for all of your hard work and the assessor's office and our town assessor, Lauren Elliott, all of them for their friendship and their support over these last few years. <laughs> this job wouldn't be nearly as fun without your uh, collegiality and support and hard work as well. Jeff Raymer, BET Vice Chair, will assume the role of BET Chair on my resignation, and I'm appointing uh, Mr. Raymer to also fill my spot on the Audit Committee. I look forward to joining those sitting in the audience or watching from home in the future. Thank you all very much. Did you get no, I did not. Actually, I'm about to say yippee. <laughs> <laughs> but don't report that, Ken. I won't. Yeah. I don't even know how to spell yippee. <laughs> so so the, the next item on our agenda is the approval of the BET meeting minutes. You've all received draft minutes from the September 19th BET workshop on Railroad Plaza and the September 23rd and Octo October 24th BET regular meetings. I, I note, Mr. Mason, that you had one edit to the minutes that you distributed. No, it was Mr. Drake. I'm, oh. I'm sorry. It was Mr. Drake. Oh, Madam Chairman. Yes, Mr. Raymer. Uh, I, I wonder if I could ask a matter of personal privilege. Um, I'm late uh, doing it, but I, I see that uh, in the minutes of October uh, 24th, uh, there are some points that I should um, uh, propose correction of, and I would ask that just those minutes be deferred to the next meeting. Uh, I have no uh, concern as to the other two minutes that are being proposed. Is there any objection to deferring the October 24th minutes? 
Hearing none, I believe you, Mr. Drake's comment relates to the October 24th minute, so we can take that up all together. And Ms. Crummick? Yes, motion, please. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the workshop of the BET on the Greenwich Transportation Center Redevelopment Agreement held on September 19th, 2019, and the regular the minutes of the regular meeting of the BET held on September 23rd, 2019. Second. A motion by Ms. Cromick, seconded by Ms. Targington. All in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? That item has carried. That, that concludes the November meeting. Mr. Deuce. I move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Who, who seconded the minutes? Who seconded my...